right the same. Great to see our panel again. Hello, Ms. Bays. Let's give Ms. Levin a chance. I don't know if it's Ms. or Mr. Levin, so let's. It's Ms. Levin. And who's our bailiff? Frankford Johnson. I'm here. Thank you. All right. Uh, Mr. Johnson, are we okay to proceed? I will check. Hi, Deb. Are you okay? I am. I got kicked out. I'm back in. Sorry. Okay. All right. Great. Great to see you. Thanks for doing this. You bet. We should be good now. We're okay now? Yes. Fantastic. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. I would think that probably almost all of you are probably in the afternoon by now. Uh, so now that everyone is here, we can get started. So let me go ahead and call the case of United States versus Kara Bassett. My name is Judge A.J. Bellido de Luna. That's a really, really hard name. My last name is Bellido de Luna. You don't have to say my name. You can say Judge or Your Honor, and that's fine. Uh, I'm okay with that. Uh, but please don't call me Judge de Luna. Don't, don't do that. Um, scoring judges, at this time, it looks like you are all um, on mute, and hopefully your audio is also on mute. If you could please make sure that both of those are on mute at this time, I'd appreciate it. And these should remain off until our trial ends. Um, you should have your video set to hide all non-video participants. So this would mean that the only people that you should be seeing on the screen right now should be me and the advocates. Um, all right, I wanna just say one thing before I ask the attorneys to mark their appearances. And that is that I am in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, Deb, can you please mute your video? Down in the lower left-hand corner, it says mute and then stop video. Just click where it says stop video. There you go. Um, for the advocates, I just want you to know that I am in San Antonio, Texas. We are getting a few bands from Hurricane Hannah. Um, so we had some high winds earlier today. I'm at our law school, so I'm hardwired in. I didn't want to be at home, you know, and risk it with wireless. Um, unless power goes out at the school, you you're not going to know the difference. Um, but if the power goes out, that means I'm going to disappear for a minute or two. Uh, if that happens, just stop. Uh, Mr. Johnson, please just stop the clock and just relax for a couple of minutes. The Everything will come back on, our, 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 um, our backup systems will kick in, but it'll take a few minutes for the internet to kick back in. So if that happens, just relax. It has nothing to do with you. We should be fine, nothing should happen, but I just, just in case, um, I don't want you to get all freaked out if that, if that were to occur, okay? So um, at this time, we're gonna hear some open, I'm sorry, um, can we, I guess, enter our appearances, and then if there's any housekeeping, we can take care of that. So first, let's enter your appearances for the prosecution. Good, good afternoon, Your Honor. My name is Rachel Bates, and I, along with my co-counsel, Ms. Katie Hensel. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Ms. Hensel. We'll be representing the prosecution in today's case. Great, good afternoon to both of you. And for the defense. Good afternoon, Your Honor, members of the jury. My name is Madeline Levin, and today I represent my client, Kara Bassett. I'm joined by my second chair, Mr. Jackson Cundy. Good afternoon, Your Honor, members of the jury. Good, good afternoon. Can I just get the, the, your last name again? Cundy. I, I can't make that out. Cundy? Cundy, sorry. K U N D. K U N D. Cund. Oh, I got that. Was there an E at the end? Yes, sir. All right. Good afternoon to both of you as well. 
Um, before we get to opening statements, are there any preliminary matters that you wish to deal with? Ms. Bays, I'll come to you first. Yes, Your Honor. Do you have a copy of the pretrial order in front of you? I do have a copy of the pretrial order in front of me in electronic format. I would like to direct your attention to item number seven. Give me a moment to, okay. It states that exhibits four through 33 are pre-admitted and may be used at any time for any purpose. That is right. And I, uh, because we have uh, pre-admitted all of these documents, you may, without seeking leave of the court, you may publish, uh, either side may publish those without permission of the court at any time. Just four through 33. Yes. Okay. Next, I would like to direct your attention to item number nine. Okay. It states that given the online format, the prosecution need not identify the defendant. Yes, that's right, thank you. And finally, I would like to invoke rule 615, the constructive sequestration of all non-party representative witnesses. In this case, our party representative would be Agent Brandon. All right, Ms. Uh, Levin, um, are you okay with that? Any objection to that? Your Honor, it's our understanding that all witnesses are constructively sequestered. And is there a rule on that? I believe Rule 615 just says non-party representatives. In this case, we're happy with all of them being sequestered. All right, so you don't want your party uh, representative, you don't want the agent in the courtroom? Given that we are going first, I see no need. I agree. All right, uh, Ms. Levin, and clearly the only, you're only calling the defendant, or who are you calling? We'll be calling Ms. Jo Young. The defendant is constructively present at trial, but she won't right. be testifying. Right, right. Um, okay, so um, Ms. Jo Young is not a party representative, right? That's true. That's why it's our understanding all witnesses will be constructively sequestered. All right, so I'll then grant that motion. Um, she is constructively uh, sequestered, but since you're going first, Ms. Bayes, you don't have a problem with um, your witness being constructively sequestered, so I, I, uh, you're, you're granted on your motion. With that, the prosecution is ready to proceed. All right. Ms. Levin, do you have uh, any housekeeping matters that we should deal with? No, Your Honor. We're ready to proceed. All right. Very good. Uh, before opening statements, um, for the members of the jury, we're now going to hear the opening statements from each party. Everyone should make sure that they are in speaker view. You're going to find that button in the upper right hand corner. You might be in gallery view right now. If you just click on gallery view, it'll then turn to um, speaker view. And please remember to keep your uh, audio muted and your video muted. Um, and um, each attorney while the other is speaking, please make sure that they're muted as well. With that, I'm ready to proceed to opening statements. Ms. Bays, whenever you're ready. May it please the court, opposing counsel, members of the jury. She wanted the money, but not the marriage. This is a murder trial. The man you see on your screen right now was killed on August 18th, 2017. His name was Don Clark. He's a 38 year old father and a local zoo owner. He was drugged, driven 100 miles, dumped into a swamp, and left for dead. Today you'll learn that the person who did it did it because they wanted his eight million dollar fortune. The person who did it was his wife. The defendant, this woman, Kara Bassett, because she wanted his money, but not the marriage. Today we'll show you why and how this crime occurred. We'll start with why. Today you'll learn that in 2011, when the defendant first married Don Clark, they were just like any other happy couple. But then things started to go wrong. 
the defendant became unhappy with their relationship. In February of 2017, she met someone new. She fell in love with a man named Hugh Bassett. She still wanted God's money, but not the marriage. Today you'll learn that she got what she wanted. You still hear that she made an agreement with her husband. If he were to die or disappear, she would get all his money. And sure enough, just two months after making that agreement, he did disappear. Because she wanted the money, but not marriage. That brings us to how to describe her. Today you'll learn here from a FBI agent Brandon. He's going to walk you through the physical evidence. He'll tell you about a park that Don and Kara ran. And how at that park, they kept a dangerous elephant tranquilizer. And on the night Mr. Clark went missing, so did a syringe of this tranquilizer. Today we'll prove that missing syringe was what the defendant used to kill her husband. And you'll learn what she did with the body. You'll hear how six of Mr. Clark's hairs were found in the back of this van. And on the night Mr. Clark disappeared, this van drove across the state of Florida from the Penance Zoo to a place called Big Gum Swamp, which you can see on your screen now. You'll even hear that algae from that swamp was found on the defendant's boots. Then you'll hear how her actions gave her away. You'll hear how she waited a full week to, repeat her, to report her husband missing. She didn't call him, didn't text him, didn't ask where he was because she already knew where he was. She already knew that she had killed him because she wanted the money but not the marriage. That's why we charged her with murder. That means we need to prove two things beyond a reasonable doubt. First, that the defendant's actions led to the death of her husband. Second, that it wasn't an accident. We're gonna meet that burden because we're going to prove that she wanted the money, but not the marriage. That's why at the end of today's trial, I'm gonna come back before you and ask that you find the defendant guilty. Thank you. Opening statement from the defense, Your Honor. Thank you, Ms. Bays. Ms. Levin, you may proceed. He had a plan, she wasn't part of it. Members of the jury, this case begins and ends with a failed marriage. A marriage between Kara Bassett and Don Clark, a marriage that ended. But not in the way opposing counsel just told you it did. Kara Bassett didn't kill her husband he left her. Members of the jury, today you'll hear the real story of what happened on August 18th. You'll learn how Don Clark walked outside of his home at the Greater Tallahassee Elephant Park, picked up his phone, and texted his wife for the last time. He said, going out for a while. Then, he got inside his van and disappeared. Don Clark abandoned his wife, abandoned her after years of a tense relationship, after months of planning and finalizing a move to Costa Rica. You'll hear that just weeks before Don Clark disappeared, he was in contact with his lawyer. He told his lawyer about a vacation home in Costa Rica, about off the books cash, about how he wanted to keep everything a secret from his wife. And you'll hear that on August 18th, Don Clark was in contact with someone already in Costa Rica. You'll learn 
Don Clark talked to that individual for 52 minutes and hours later, he was gone. Members of the jury, today the government has charged Kara Bassett with first degree murder. But they can't just tell you she's guilty. They have the highest burden in our criminal justice system, proof beyond a reasonable doubt. They won't be able to meet that burden today. Because lead FBI agent Steph Branham will tell you about his investigation, and when he does, I want you to keep three questions in mind. One, did the FBI find any eyewitnesses who saw Ms. Bassett at all on August 18th? Two, did the FBI ever recover Don Clark's body? And three, did the FBI ever recover a murder weapon, that syringe of carfentanil they just told you about in their opening statement? Members of the jury, you'll learn that the answer to all three of these questions is no. That's why no one, not even the government themselves, can tell you definitively that Don Clark is dead. And you'll find it's not just that they didn't find evidence, it's that they overlooked evidence. You'll hear Agent Branham never went to Costa Rica to look for Don Clark. You'll hear Agent Branham never found that individual Don Clark spoke to just hours before he disappeared. You'll learn the government never ruled out the reasonable possibility that Don Clark is alive and well in Costa Rica today. Members of the jury, he had a plan. She was never a part of it. But the government is holding Ms. Bassett responsible anyway. That's why at the end of today's trial, I'll ask you to find Kara Bassett not guilty. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Slevin. Now, before our first witness, uh, I'm gonna ask everyone to switch back to gallery view. And once again, that button is up in the upper right hand corner of your screen. And this is going to allow you to see the attorneys and witnesses at the same time. Ms. Bays, you may call your first witness. At this time, the prosecution calls Agent Branham to the stand. Agent Branham, you've been sworn. Ms. Bays, when you're ready. Please introduce yourself to the members of the jury. Oh, good afternoon. My name is Steph Branham. What do you do for a living? I'm a senior special agent for the FBI's Criminal Investigations Division. What's your background with the FBI? I've been working with the FBI for almost 20 years now. I've investigated over 100 cases. Uh, mainly ones involving uh, robberies, uh, murder, serial, serial murder, or kidnapping. And how did you get involved with today's case? Uh, I was called by the defendant to investigate the disappearance of a Mr. Don Clark, a lo local business owner. You know, their investigation resulted in the arrest of his wife, the defendant, for murder. Did you ever find out when he disappeared? Uh, according to the defendant, he disappeared on August 18th. Ms. Hensel, can we pull up a timeline? Can you add his disappearance to that timeline? You said he disappeared on the 18th. When did you find out he went missing? Uh, we didn't find out till a week later, August 25th. Ms. Hensel? Now, how do you investigate a case like this? Well, we first look at the victim's finances, searching for any possible motive. And then we look at the forensic evidence found at the crime scene. Uh, basically, we first look at the why, and then the how they disappear. Let's start with the why then. Did you ever find out how much money Don Clark had when he disappeared? The defendant said he was valued at around $8 million. 
I'm now going to show you what's been previously admitted as Exhibit 4. Do you recognize this? Uh, I do, ma'am. Uh, this is a letter from Clark's attorney. I'd like to walk through this letter with you. Let's start with the paragraph that begins on May 1st. In this paragraph, what does it say would happen to those $8 million if Don Clark were to go missing? The defendant would get all of it. Senzel, can we add that to our timeline? Did you ever find any evidence that the defendant did get that money? Uh, she did. Uh, she invoked the power of attorney on October 1st, uh, just a couple months after he disappeared. Ms. Hensel? All right. Now I'd like to move on to the paragraph in the letter that begins on June 17th. In this paragraph, how does it say Don Clark and the defendant's relationship was going? Well, the, Don Clark actually filed a restraining order against the defendant. Sensel, can we add that to our timeline? Would you recognize that restraining order if I were to show it to you? I would, ma'am. Do you have a copy of Exhibit 34 in front of you? Yes, ma'am, I do. What is it? Uh, this is the restraining order we were just talking about. Does it appear to be a fair and accurate copy of that restraining order? It does, ma'am, yes. At this time, the prosecution moves to enter Exhibit 34 into evidence. Objection, Your Honor. Hearsay as to Don Clark's statements within this document. What do you say to that, Ms. Bays? Your Honor, the statements in this document were made by Don Clark, and as such, they fall under the exception of Rule 804B2. 804B2 says that any statements made by a declarant who is unavailable in a murder trial, who believes that they are going to die, about the cause or circumstances of their death, is admissible. In this case, Don Clark is unavailable because he's dead. This is a murder trial. Let's think for availableness. And in the exhibit, he says that he believes that Kara is going to kill him. That clearly he believes he is going to die. He also describes why he believes Kara is going to kill him. Oh, no which help. The cause or circumstances of his death. Ms. Levin, do you have a response? I, Your Honor, in this, Your Honor, there isn't, hasn't been sufficient foundation that within this document, Don Clark actually believed that his, that his life was in fact, was in fact in danger. All we have from this document are statements that actually go directly to the truth value of what the defendant had access to. For example, in this document, Don Clark talks about how his wife uh, had a gun and how his wife had actually hidden his own gun. Your Honor, those statements have nothing to do with Don Clark's emotional state at the time or how he felt about his wife if he was scared of his wife. Your Honor, we have no issue with certain statements in the document being admitted. Statements that do directly corroborate the fact that Don Clark was afraid of his wife. But the rest of the statements in this document that go directly to what the defendant had access to are still an admissible hearsay. I tend to agree with you, Ms. Levin, and unless you can lay a, a better foundation, Ms. Bays, I'm going to sustain that objection. Your Honor, may I ask that we enter those specific statements that opposing counsel has agreed fall up under the exception? So we want to uh, constructively redact the document and only, yes, only permit those uh, pieces since we can't actually redact? Is that, is that what we're going to do? Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Your Honor Levin? To clarify that, there's actually only one statement in this document that goes towards Don Clark's state of mind or his belief that his wife was going to kill him. It's the statement that is, I am afraid she's going to kill me. That is the only statement that falls under the exception. Your Honor, we agree. That's the statement we're trying to enter. All right, so the remainder of the document, I'm gonna sustain the objection, the initial objection but we'll allow Exhibit 34 to come in in a limited way with all of the document redacted constructively, except for that one statement. So any reference to the remainder of the document should never be made in front of the jury. Are we in agreement? Do we understand, I mean? Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Levin? That's okay with us, Your Honor. Okay, let's come back in in front of the jury. Ms. Hensel, can you pull up that line? 
Mr. Branham, what does this say? Uh, it says, I'm afraid she's going to kill me in my sleep, uh, specifically referring to the defendant. All right. Now I'd like to talk about how... Let's walk through the forensic evidence. Uh, can we pull up Exhibit 18? What is this? Uh, that is a syringe of carfentanil. And where did you find it? Uh, we found it at the Elephant Zoo. How many syringes did they have? Well, the park was actually supposed to have 24 syringes. How many did they have? They only had 23, ma'am. That one missing syringe, do you know how dangerous it could be? Uh, it is extremely dangerous. Uh, according to the material safety data sheet, uh, it's 5,000 times more toxic than heroin. You only need about one milligram to kill an adult male. I'm now going to show you what's been previously entered as Exhibit 26. What is this? Uh, that's a photo of the zoo van. And why was the zoo van important to your investigation? Well, we actually reviewed the GPS data from this van on the night Clark disappeared. Did you find anything that tied Mr. Clark to the van? Uh, we did, ma'am. Uh, we found six hair strands from Mr. Clark in the back of the zoo van. All right, well, let's look at that GPS data. Ms. Ensel, can we pull up Exhibit 31? Let's zoom in on Segment 2. What does Segment 2 tell us? Well, according to this part right here, uh, the van was driven from the Elephant Park uh, to the Big Gum Swamp. It's about a 140-mile trip. And what's the Big Gum Swamp? Uh, it's a 10,000-acre marshland uh, located, located in Upper Florida. All right, let's switch over to segment four. What does segment four tell us? Well, uh, after the van was sitting at the park, it was driven back uh, to a, the Cary Bellion Airport, so very close to the elephant zoo. All right, now I'm gonna show you what's been previously admitted as exhibit 28. What is this? Uh, that's a photo of the ground at the Big Gum Swamp. And why is the ground important? Well, I actually had my forensics team uh, run an analysis, and there's actually a very rare combination of algae uh, found at the swamp. And why is that algae important? Well, we found it two places. Uh, we found it on the van that was driven to the swamp, and we also found it at the elephant park on a pair of boots. Sensel, can we pull up exhibit 29? What are these? Though they're the boots I was just talking about. Did you ever find out who those boots belonged to? Uh, the defendant said they belonged to her. Thank you. No further questions. Cross-examination, Your Honor. Yes, we get. Good afternoon, Agent Branham. Good afternoon. Let's begin with the evidence you had collected when you arrested Kara Bassett. You arrested Ms. Bassett in September of 2018, right? Uh, that is correct, uh, after our year investigation. Let's talk about what happened in that year-long investigation. You never found any eyewitnesses who saw Ms. Bassett drag her husband's body into the swamp on August 18th right? Uh, no, ma'am. It was in the middle of the night. Well, you also didn't find any eyewitnesses who saw Miss Bassett travel over 270 miles total on August 18th. True? Uh, that is correct. Uh, we don't have anyone watching the van, per se, but we do have the GPS records showing where the van went. Agent, I'm not talking about the GPS records. You don't have any eyewitnesses for those 270 miles that you claim Ms. Bassett was driving, right? Uh, if you're asking if anyone was watching the van while she was driving, uh, no ma'am. You also don't have any eyewitnesses who saw Ms. Bassett pull into the airport in the morning. Uh, no ma'am, we do not. 
Agent, let's move now to some other evidence you never were able to collect. Uh, used canvas to Big Gump Swamp, right? Oh, we did, ma'am? Did that in late August of 2017. That is correct. You were never able to find Don Clark's body, true? Uh, no, ma'am. Uh, it is a 10,000 acre swamp, very deep. Unfortunately, we were unable to locate exactly where the body was. Agent, I'm, I'm not asking why you weren't able to find the body. That's a yes, you weren't able to find it, right? Uh, no, ma'am. Uh, like I said, it was a very big swamp. We were unable to locate it. You were also unable to locate Don Clark's keys, right? Uh, the keys to the van? Uh, yes, ma'am. We were not, we were unable to locate that. Unable to locate Don Clark's phone? That is correct. Unable to locate his wallet? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, these were likely destroyed when he disappeared. You never found any of them, right? Uh, no, ma'am. Uh, Agent, let's talk about one other thing you never found. Mr. Cundy, could we get Exhibit 18 up for the jury? Agent, this is a syringe of carfentanil, right? It is. Mm -hmm. But it's not the syringe of carfentanil you believed Miss Bassett used to kill her husband. True? Well, uh, no, ma'am. Uh, that syringe would be empty not full. Right, but you never found that syringe of carfentanil you believe Miss Bassett used to kill her husband. Uh, we did not find the syringe itself, no ma'am. And let's talk about what that all means. Because you don't have a body, you don't have an autopsy, right? Uh, that is correct. You don't have a toxicology report. Uh, of the body itself, uh, no ma'am. You don't have a fingerprint test of the alleged murder weapon. Of the syringe? Uh, no, ma'am. And because you don't have a toxicology report, you can't be sure that carfentanil was actually in Don Clark's system. Um, we can't be 100% sure, but as the Elephant Park was missing a poison, uh, missing this poison, it is very likely that it was. But agent, because you don't have a toxicology report, you weren't able to conduct forensic testing to confirm that, right? That is correct, yes ma'am. Agent, let's talk a little bit about the evidence that you did collect. Now, you believe that samples from Big Gum Swamp of algae match samples of algae from Miss Bassett's boots, right? Uh, they do, ma'am. Uh, that is what this forensic uh, report showed. Mr. Cundy, could we get Exhibit 25 up for the jury? Agent, this is Kara Bassett's elephant park, right? It is, ma'am. There's a watering hole at that elephant park? Uh, yes, ma'am, that's the majority of the picture right there. There are trees at this elephant park, right? There are. Agent, you didn't collect a single sample of algae from Miss Bassett's own home. Uh, we, we did not find any algae there to collect, no, ma'am. Agent, you're telling us there wasn't any algae at Miss Bassett's five square mile outdoor elephant park? Uh, not that we discovered, no. That's a yes, you didn't collect any, sam any samples then, right? Uh, like I said, we didn't find any samples to collect. Agent, you were there for a full week, right? Uh, we actually, this is part of a year investigation, ma'am. So you were, at the, you were at the elephant park multiple times in that investigation? Yes, ma'am. And we were unable to locate any of the algae that would match the big gum swamp. So you're testifying that there wasn't any algae at an elephant park with a watering hole? Uh, not that specific type of algae, no, ma'am. Well, Agent, you don't know it's that specific type of algae because you didn't collect a sample of it. Like I said, we did not find any specific samples that would match uh, the, uh, the big gum swamp. It was a very, very rare type of algae. Agent, just to clarify, you don't know if samples of algae from the elephant park would match the swamp because you never ran any forensic testing on them. Exactly. There wasn't any algae that we discovered. Okay, Agent, but let's move on and talk about something you didn't mention on direct examination. Now, you told us you ruled out all possibilities of how Don Clark disappeared, right? Uh, I would like to think so, yes ma'am. Let's talk about one of those possibilities. Mr. Cundy, could we get exhibit four 
up for the jury? This is a letter that Don Clark's attorney sent to you, true? Uh, yes, ma'am, it is. You were aware of this letter when you arrested Kara Bassett? Uh, I was, we did have this letter. So you were aware that Don Clark had off the books cash, right? Uh, according to this letter, uh, that is what it says. You were also aware that Don Clark was in contact with someone in Costa Rica on August 18th, true? Uh, he did uh, receive a text from someone in Costa Rica. And then he called that person for 52 minutes, true? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to determine exactly who the caller was, but we do know it was from Costa Rica. And because you weren't able to find the caller, you don't know what Don Clark was talking about with this individual from Costa Rica on August 18th, true? Uh, we don't know, no ma'am. Thank you, Agent. Nothing further. All right, thank you, uh, Ms. Levin. Uh, Ms. Bays, um, do you have a redirect? Yes, Your Honor. May I proceed? You may. Agent, opposing counsel came before you and asked you about some questions about Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. Did you ever find a way for Mr. Clark to get to Costa Rica? Uh, actually, it wouldn't seem that he had a way. Uh, his uh, private jet that he had was still at his hangar in Florida. And we also uh, interviewed local police at Costa Rica. Did you, any of them say anything about him being there? No, ma'am. They were unable to locate him. And did you find any evidence that that plane had left the airport? Uh, no, ma'am. It stayed there the entire night. With that, I have no further questions. Uh, but before I pass the witness, I would read a stipulation onto the record. All right. Which stipulation do you plan on reading? Stipulation number 19. Okay. Stipulation 19 says, apart from financial transactions initiated by Kara Bassett, through her power of attorney and her inheritance. There has been no financial activity concerning Don Clark's bank accounts, credit cards, real properties, or investments since August 18th, 2017. And with that, I pass the witness. Um, all right, there is, is there a recross permitted? I think you ran out of time anyway. So no recross, you, no, There wouldn't be any recross anyway. All right, can this witness be excused, Ms. Bays? Yes, Your Honor. All right, uh, thank you very much, Agent. He left. All right, Ms. Uh, Bays, do you have any other witnesses or testimony? No, Your Honor. With that, the prosecution rests. All right, very well. Ms. Levin, do you wish to call any witnesses? Yes, Your Honor. The defense calls Joe Young to the witness stand. Ms. Young, hello. You have been sworn. Ms. Yes, Levin, your witness. Hi. Good afternoon, Ms. Young. Good afternoon. What do you do for a living? Uh, I'm a videographer, a film director. I've worked on a lot of documentaries. I'm hoping to get on the campaign trail this year. Should be some interesting stuff coming. Do you know Kara Bassett? I do, yeah. Um, she hired me back in 2015 to film her. She actually has a really cool story. She lives on an elephant park, which is crazy. How often do you get an opportunity to film at an elephant park? And so I just followed her around, filmed her with the elephant, filmed her in her personal life. Um, it was a really cool opportunity. Miss Young, when you were filming Miss Bassett for the documentary, did you ever meet Don Clark? I did, yeah. That was her husband. Um, he was a really sweet guy. And how often did you film the two of them at the elephant park? Oh, I mean, if Caro and Don were there, I was filming. I mean, it was a full-time job. I was there eight to five, five days a week, sometimes longer if we had certain footage we needed to collect. And how many years were you working at the elephant park? A good three years at least. Got a lot of stuff filmed. Miss Young, let's move now to the last day you ever saw. Don Clark. What day was that? That would be 
August 18th of 2017. Did anything seem unusual about Miss Bassett on the 18th? No, actually, she was in a really good mood that day. It was, it was a good day. Objection, speculation. Your Honor, may I respond? No, I'm going to overrule that objection. Ms. Young, did you also speak to Don Clark on the 18th? Yeah, I did. Uh, we were chatting a little bit right before I left the park. Uh, kind of a strange conversation, though. What happened during that conversation? Well, you know, we're just chatting along, talking about what's going on in our lives, and all of a sudden he looks down at his phone and he just goes like white as a sheet. It, it was like he'd seen a ghost or something and just walks away. That, that was the last time I saw him. What time did that conversation take place? I would have been right at about six o'clock in the evening. Mr. Cundy, could we get exhibit 21 up for the jury? These are Don Clark's phone records. Yeah. Have you seen these records before? Yes, I have. So are you aware of what happened on Don Clark's phone at around the time you talked to him? Yeah, so it looks like he actually got some text messages from a number in Costa Rica right at that time when, you know, I told you he went white. Um, yeah. Do you know what those texts say? Uh, my Spanish is a little rusty, but I'm pretty sure it translates to call me and immediately. Do you know if Mr. Clark ever called that number? Yeah, over in his call log section, there's a call at 6 p.m. to this number in Costa Rica. So that must have been like right after I left. And how much time did Don Clark spend talking to this person? 52 minutes. Now, following this phone call conversation, were there any texts sent to Kara Bassett? Um, on August 18th? Yes. Uh, she received some texts from Don Clark, um, I think from her sister. Did she receive any texts? Uh, can you say specifically what she received from Don Clark? Yeah, they were talking about um, a trip to CR, uh, just what they were up to that day, things that might be coming up. Later in the day, did Don Clark send any texts to his wife? Uh, no, it looks like the last text message he sent her was at like two in the afternoon. Uh, Miss Young, did he send any texts much later in the evening? Uh, the last text that he sent was at about 11 o'clock at night. It just said, uh, going out for a while. Now, Miss Young, did you ever see Don Clark again following his 52-minute phone call? No. Like I said, that was the last time I ever saw Don Clark. Miss Young, I want to move now to the FBI's investigation. Did you ever see the FBI at the Elephant Park? Yeah, when I got back to the Elephant Park, the investigation was in full swing and I was filming as much as I could. Made a really great episode for our documentary. Well, what did you see the FBI doing at the park? Well, you know, they were running around, talking to some people, carrying some stuff around. Yeah, that's all I can really say. What was an example of an object you saw FBI agents carrying? Well, there were a lot of them, but I noticed that they were handling the elephant tranquilizers a lot. They're these syringes they keep in case the elephants, you know, get injured or need medicine. And I mean, I don't, I don't know if this is proper procedure, but they weren't wearing any gloves. It seemed a little strange to me. Miss Young, how many hours of footage did you have from your time at the elephant park? I mean, the three years it added up, it was at least 2,000 hours. Did the FBI ever ask to see that footage? No, they never asked me for any of it. Thank you, Ms. Young. No further questions, Your Honor. All right, thank you, Ms. Levin. Ms. Uh, Bays, do you have a cross-examination? Yes, Your Honor. May I proceed? May, thank you. I'd like to start by talking about something you mentioned on direct examination. 
You mentioned you were filming a documentary for three years, right? That's correct. And when you first started filming that documentary, Don Clark and Kara Clark were married. Yeah, that's true. But by the time you finished filming that documentary, Don Clark had disappeared. Yeah, Don Clark's disappearance came right in the middle of the documentary. Made some really interesting storylines. By the time you finished filming, Kara Clark had married Hugh. That's true, that was the last episode of our documentary. So I wanna walk the jury through the timeline of that relationship. Ms. Enzo, can you pull our timeline up? And Your Honor, we blacked out any portion of testimony we received from Agent Branham. So as not to violate Rule 615. Thank you, Ms. Bates. Now, when you first started filming, as you said, they were married. They got along like a normal couple. Yeah, they seemed pretty happy to me at first. You know that they also started fighting in 2017. Yeah, they did. That's true. I'd like to talk about something else that happened in 2017. In February of 2017, someone named Hugh Bassett started showing up at the park. Yeah, he did. I think he was doing like some accounting or just some like number stuff for the park. Ma'am, you know that the defendant noticed him because she mentioned him to you. I mean, of course we talked about it. It was in the documentary. Ms. Enzo, can you add that to our timeline? At that point in time, you noticed that Hugh Bassett was, in your own words, a snappy dresser. Yeah, he had good style. He was pretty good looking. I mean, he wasn't really my type, but I mean, he wasn't hideous. Well, over the course of that year, you want to see him interact with the defendant. Pardon, could you repeat that? Over the course of that year, you got to see him interact with the defendant. I mean, I saw him talking to her about some accounting stuff. Whenever they were talking, she seemed really happy. Some days she did. I guess on her good days. And then, less than a year after Hugh Bassett showed up, Don Clark disappeared. That's correct. That was on August 18th. Yes, ma'am. Sensel? You know that the defendant didn't report him missing for a whole week. That's my understanding from the call logs that she called the police on the 25th. Ms. Enzo, can you add that? So I'd like to talk about what happened during that week. Ms. Enzo, can we pull up Exhibit 22? You saw these on, in an interview? That's, yes, I did. These are the defendant's phone records. Let's zoom in on the phone call section. I want to look at the section that's after Don Clark disappeared. And then we put a box on that time frame. In that time frame, you see no texts or calls to her husband. No, there weren't any. So let's look at those texts then. Essential, let's switch over to the texts. There are no texts to her husband in that box. No, that, that's correct, there aren't. Essential, can we add those two facts to our timeline? I want to talk about something you mentioned on direct examination. You mentioned some stuff about Costa Rica, right? That's true, yep. You went to Costa Rica to look for Mr. Clark, didn't you? Yeah, I thought it would make a really great bonus episode if I could find him in Costa Rica. Stayed there for a whole week? That's correct. You searched Mr. Clark's house? Yeah, I went there to see if I could find some stuff. Film. Objection, Your Honor. Lack of foundation as to how this witness would know that it was actually Don Clark's house. Your Honor, this witness has already testified that she lived, walked around with Don Clark at the park, that she knew him. She would know if he had a house in Costa Rica. May I respond to that, Your Honor? Yes, you may. Your Honor, this witness did testify that she has known Don Clark for an extended period of time. But opposing counsel hasn't laid any foundation for how this witness would know the specific address of Don Clark's residence in another country. Yeah, I don't think she needs to say that the specific address, but I think she said that she knew his house. I think that was the witness's testimony. Um, and she said that she went there. Uh, do I have that right, Ms. Bates? You do, Your Honor. 
right, I think that's sufficient for the purposes of cross-examination. I'm going to uh, overrule the objection. You could uh, clean that up, I guess, if you want on redirect. Uh, Ms. Bayes, you may continue. We searched Mr. Clark's house. Yeah, that's correct. I knew that he had a place in Hermosa Beach, so there was this house in Hermosa Beach, and I found some clothes that looked like they could have belonged to him. Well, to be clear, you found clothes, but you didn't see Don Clark at that house. No, I didn't see him there, but I thought I saw some stuff there. Well, let's talk about the stuff you found. All the lights were out at the house. There wasn't anyone home. You didn't find any toiletries anywhere in the house? No. The fridge was empty. That's correct, yeah. It, there wasn't any food in there. So let's talk about what happened after Don Clark disappeared. After Don Clark disappeared, his wife took over the business. Yes, she did. That was in October? Yes, I mean, she had to run it as soon as Mr. Clark disappeared, but that was really when she started to take charge and try to really lead the Greater Tallahassee Elephant Park. Ms. Hensel, can we add that to our timeline? No, she didn't give up on Hugh Bassett, did she? Well, I don't really know about give up on him. I, there wasn't really much contact for several months, but he kind of came back onto the scene in January 2018. I thought it was good for Kara. That's right. In January, the two started to date. Yeah, I mean, I was glad that she finally had something in her life after losing so much. Ma'am, on August 18th, 2018, just one year after her husband's disappearance, she married Hugh Bassett. That's correct. Yes, she did. And I think they're happily married. Ms. Ensel? Thank you. No further questions. Redirect, Your Honor? Yes, Ms. Levin, you may. Ms. Young, on cross-examination, opposing counsel asked you a few questions about what you saw in Costa Rica. Could you explain what you saw in Don Clark's home? Yeah, so the house I went to, the fan was on, the place was spotless, like there wasn't a speck of dust anywhere. Um, and I mean, I found his clothes there. And how long after Don Clark's disappearance was it when you visited Costa Rica? Oh, less than a year. It was sometime during 2018. Miss Young, you told us that you went to Costa Rica yourself. Did the FBI ever ask you about your trip? <laughs> no, not a single question. Thank you, Miss Young. Nothing further. Can this witness be excused? Yes, Your Honor, we have no recross. All right, Miss Young, thank you. And with that, the defense rests. All right, Ms. Levin, thank you. Are both sides ready to go to closing arguments? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, so before we go to closing arguments, uh, everyone should please switch back to speaker view. Also, since both witnesses have completed their testimony, um, the judges, you may complete the witness portion of your ballot. Ms. Bass, Ms. Bays, before you begin, just give them 30 seconds to complete that, and you can begin whenever you're ready. Yes, Your Honor. May I proceed? You may. May it please the court, opposing counsel, members of the jury. Throughout today's trial, there's something I couldn't help but notice. And that's just how well the timeline of events matches up with the defendant's interests. Now, I know there have been a lot of dates and times thrown around today, so I want to walk you through them from the defendant's perspective. When we do that, I think something is going to be very clear. She wanted the money, but not the marriage. 
pencil, can we pull up our timeline? He's saying in her that in February of 2017, the defendant had a problem. He was married to Don Clark. He didn't want to be. He's in February of that year, she had met someone new. Someone named Hugh Bassett. Handsome, kind, frankly, she liked him better than her husband. But Hugh Bassett wasn't the one worth eight million dollars. That was Don Clark. You heard what the defendant did. You heard how she convinced her husband to make an agreement with her. If he were to die or disappear, she would get all his money, all his assets. As that summer goes on, their relationship gets worse. In June, it gets so bad that Don takes out a restraining order. Heard of that restraining order said, I'm afraid Kara will kill me. Members of the jury, that's a murder victim telling you who killed him. And on August 18, 2017, Don Clark disappeared. And that's when things get interesting because supposedly her husband's missing. She can't find him. She doesn't know where he is. But she doesn't call him, doesn't text him, doesn't ask anyone else where he is, doesn't call the police. Or she doesn't do any of the things you would expect a wife looking for their missing husband to do. So on August 25th, 2017, she finally calls the police. And less than two months later, she takes control of her husband's business. And a year later, on August 18th, 2018, just one year to the day from her husband's disappearance, she marries the man she'd wanted all along, Hugh Bassett. Yet she wanted the money, but not the marriage. That's why this crime happened. So now let's talk about how. Today you heard about this drug, a dangerous element tranquilizer, 5,000 times more toxic than heroin. A single drop could kill someone. And on the night Mr. Clark went missing, so did a syringe of his tranquilizer. Members of the jury, that's not a coincidence. That's the murder weapon. And you heard what the defendant did with the body. You heard how she put him in a van and drove him 139 miles across the state of Florida and back. Members of the only jury, the only reason someone would do that so they could drop something off that destination. That destination, that was the Big Gum Swamp. And as you can see on your screen, the Big Gum Swamp is covered in water and algae. Very specific, very rare type of algae. When the FBI traced that algae, they found it in two places. On the van that went to the swamp, and on the defendant's boots. She dropped off the body at the swamp, and then she drove home. Because she wanted the money, but not the marriage. That's why she's guilty of murder. That meant we had to prove two things beyond a reasonable doubt. First, the defendant killed her husband. Second, that she did it with malice before him. It just means that it wasn't an accident. We met that burden because we showed you why and how this crime occurred. Now, of course, the defense is a different story. They want you to believe Don Clark is still alive, that he's sitting in Costa Rica right now. Members of the jury, you heard about his house in Costa Rica. You heard how it was empty, how there was no food, no toiletries, all of the lights were off. Members of the jury, he's not in Costa Rica. Because the defendant, she killed him. Because she wanted the money, but not the marriage. Find her guilty. Thank you.
Closing argument from the defense, Your Honor. May I proceed? Members of the jury, he had a plan. He wasn't part of it. On August 18th, 2017, Don Clark abandoned his wife. He had his off the books cash ready to go, a vacation home in Costa Rica, and secrets upon secrets that ensured his wife had no idea what was happening. Because Kara Bassett wasn't aware of her husband's plans, but the government is holding her responsible anyway. And they can't just tell you she's guilty. They have the highest burden in our criminal justice system, proof beyond a reasonable doubt. So let's walk through the evidence that they presented you with today. They told you about a man named Hugh Bassett. They told you about Ms. Bassett's response to her husband's disappearance. They focused on those two elements because that's all they have. Members of the jury, I ask you to look for physical evidence, physical proof that ties, the, that ties Ms. Bassett to the crime because I'm confident you won't find any. Now, Agent Branham told you today that he found a rare combination of algae on Ms. Bassett's boots, the same combination at the swamp. Members of the jury, I want you to take a look at this photo that's up on the screen now. This is a photo of Miss Bassett's elephant park. Agent Branham got up on cross-examination and he told you that nowhere in this entire five square mile elephant park was there a single sample of algae for him to collect. And then he told you that's because samples of algae from the elephant park don't match samples of algae from Miss Bassett's boots. Members of the jury, he can't say that for sure because he never collected a single sample of algae from Ms. Bassett's elephant park. Why? Because Agent Granham knew. Collecting samples of algae from Big Gum Swamp would only point towards Ms. Bassett's guilt, but finding samples of algae at the elephant park would only point towards her innocence, so Agent Granham chose. To only present one side of the story to his forensic analyst, chose to only present that side of the story to you in trial today. That's not forensic proof. That's an assumption. And that incomplete analysis of algae is the only piece of physical evidence that the government presented you with today. At the beginning of today's trial, I asked you three questions. Did the FBI find eyewitnesses? who saw Ms. Bassett at all on August 18th? The answer to that question is no. I asked you if the FBI ever recovered Don Clark's body. The answer to that question is also no. Now the government told you they know exactly where his body is. They told you it's in Big Gum Swamp, but members of the jury, they never found that body. Never found Don Clark's keys, never found his wallet, never found his phone. And they also never found that syringe of car fentanyl. The opposing counsel just got up here and they told you that because a syringe of car fentanyl went missing, it's the murder weapon. Members of the jury, they're asking you to make guesswork. They're asking you to fill in the blanks in their investigation because the truth is Agent Branham never found the murder weapon. We don't have a body. We don't have a cause of death. We can't say for sure that Don Clark is dead. So what happens when we look beyond Agent Branham's investigation? The government told you over and over throughout today's trial that Don Clark was afraid of his wife, that he was afraid she was going to kill him. Members of the jury, that's why he went to Costa Rica. He had a motive to go. We agree. 
he had a tense relationship with his wife. They argued over the elephant park. Members of the jury, all of that is true. Not only did Don Clark have a motive to go to Costa Rica to get away from his wife, he also had the capability to get there. You heard today, he had a substantial amount of off the books cash. Enough off the books cash to buy another property in Costa Rica, not that he would need to because he already had a vacation home set up for him there. Now opposing counsel read out a stipulation today about Don Clark's financial transactions. Members of the jury, the definition of off the books cash is that it's off the books. Aiden Branham never traced that cash. We don't know if Don Clark ever used that cash. That's not all. We do know that Don Clark had a contact in Costa Rica. Someone he spoke to for 52 minutes on the night he disappeared. Members of the jury, we don't know what happened in that phone call conversation. We don't know. If that individual chartered Don Clark a plane, rented him a car, members of the jury, we have no idea because the FBI never found that person. But we know that Don Clark made it to Costa Rica. You heard today at his vacation home, the fan was on. A year after he went missing, his clothes were in the closets. The place was spotless. We have evidence he made it there. But Agent Branham isn't even aware of that evidence because he never asked Joe Young about her trip to Costa Rica. Members of the jury, at the end of the day, the government has a responsibility. A responsibility not to point fingers, a responsibility to find Don Clark dead or alive, a responsibility they failed. Their case boils down to an incomplete analysis of algae. That's not enough. Members of the jury, you don't have to make the same mistake as the government. Find Kara Bassett not guilty. Thank you. Rebuttal, Your Honor. Thank you, Ms. Levin. Yes, Ms. Bays. May I proceed? You may. May it please the court, opposing counsel, members of the jury. Costa Rica. That's the place that's been brought up a lot today, but you heard about Costa Rica. They want you to believe he was there because his clothes were in the closet, but members of the jury, you can put clothes in a closet at any time. You can't survive without food. Then they told you that our case didn't hold up. But members of the jury, our case does hold up. Six hairs. Six hairs in the back of a van that belonged to Don Clark. That van, on the night he disappears, it drives 139 miles across the state of Florida. Goes to Big Gum Swamp. The algae from Big Gum Swamp, it's found on the defendant's boots. Members of the jury, all the physical evidence points to the defendant. Because she wanted the money and not the marriage. So she killed her husband. Find her guilty. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you, Ms. Bays. Um, all right, at this time, Judges, you should please complete your ballots and click submit. And I'm gonna ask everyone to stay on until everyone has submitted their ballots. And then we could give some brief comments. Judges, as soon as you uh, submit your ballot, if you could bring your video online, that way we know that you've submitted it, but we'll have to wait for our bailiff to give us the all clear. <laughs> 